the mass of what is absorbing the energy? What is it that's actually absorbing the energy that's being given out? And in here, where will most of the heat energy go as it's given out here? What would it be absorbed CO2 by? CO2 what will heat up? CO2 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 the solution. The solution will heat up. Okay. So what is the mass of this solution? What's the mass of the solution? 50 grams, because it's 50 centimeters cubed. We can assume that it's water. Why not? We're going to make some assumptions. We assume that it's water. So we're going to say that the mass of the solution is 50 grams. Okay. But what else are we adding? We're adding the zinc as well. Now, just watch out, because in some textbooks you will see that they add the mass of zinc as being something which will absorb the heat, yes? In other in textbooks you'll see that they don't include the mass of the reactant, whatever is reacting. Okay. But I've seen on the mark scheme for the IB papers that they tend to include this, okay. so I would include it as well. So in this case we would say 50 plus 10 is the total mass of everything which is absorbing heat. Now we're going to make a gross generalization here because what are we going to say the specific heat capacity is? 4.2. 4.2 joules per kg per gram, yes? 4.2 joules per k per gram. It's very important we know what our units are. Sometimes you see equations of 4,200 and that's joules per k per kilogram. Okay, but here we have joules per k per gram, 4.2. Now we're assuming that everything that's absorbing the heat has the same specific heat capacity as water, yes? And then we multiply it by the temperature change. And let's suppose it goes from 25 degrees C to 45 degrees C, so that would be 20, and it doesn't matter whether it's in degrees C or K because it's a temperature difference, okay, and those are the same. Now, sorry, I haven't put the units in very clearly. Joules per K, that's a capital K for Kelvin per gram. That's how it should be written. Joules per K per gram. Now, what does that specific heat capacity mean? I think in order to really grasp this, you need to understand it. What it means is, how much energy in joules does it take to raise the temperature by 1K, or 1 degree C, of 1 gram of the substance? Okay. So if I had a little block of mm, glass, specific heat capacity of glass, I had one gram of glass, it would be quite a small block, one gram of glass. How much energy would it take to raise that temperature by 1K? And that's what the specific heat capacity is. Okay. And so that's why, why, that's why I said it was a gross generalisation, because of course we need, we've got water there, but we haven't really got water, have we? We've actually got copper sulfate solution. And so the specific heat capacity of copper sulfate solution will be slightly different to water. So we, we've actually introduced an error there. But also, the specific heat capacity of zinc, which we've included, will not be the same as the specific heat capacity of water. In fact, it will be a lot, lot lower, because water has quite a high specific heat capacity. It can absorb a lot of heat before the temperature changes. Whereas things like metals, they have very low specific heat capacities, because they heat up very easily. Okay. So what we do then for this is, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the calculation by the way, because I'm just telling you how you would you do it okay, for all of these calculations, otherwise we'd be here too long. But what you would do is you take your mass, you multiply it by the specific heat capacity, you multiply it by the temperature, and that tells you the total energy in your particular reaction. Yes? That tells you the energy that's been given out for your particular reaction. And then all you have to do is, if you're finding it for one mole, if you're finding the standard, uh, the the, uh, the uh, say, uh, I don't know, the standard um, enthalpy change for one mole for this reaction, then you just have to multiply up or multiply down or divide down or whatever. So, for example, in this particular case, we know the zinc's in excess, so the question is how many moles of copper sulfate have we got here? Well, the answer is 50 over 1,000, isn't it? Yes, 1 20th. Is everyone with me here? Have I made a mistake there, or is that right? No, no that's right. So, it's, uh, so it's, a, it's one twentieth of a mole. And so whatever energy we get from this calculation in joules, remember, this is the energy in joules, that's for one twentieth of a mole. So to get one mole of copper sulfate reacting with zinc, I have to multiply it up by 20 to get 
the value for one mole per k. Do you follow? And that's the sort of question you'll get. There will be, not there will be, because it's possible there won't, but if it's very possible that there will be a question like this. There will definitely be a question on Hess's law, which is where I'm going to go next. But often there is a question on this, delta H is MC, delta T. Any questions about that? Yes, absolutely. Because what will happen, of course, is when you calculate this, this value, you'll get a positive value if you can it out. If the temperature goes up, that will give you a positive value, won't it? But you know that delta H for an exothermic reaction is negative. And the reason it's negative here is because what you're actually finding is the delta H of the surroundings. So you just change the sign to say, well, this is the delta H of the system. Any other questions about that? Okay. Now the next thing is uh, Hess's law. And Hess's law is, again, something you just really need to practice with. And I've given you some definitions here that you will encounter, uh, not just as part of Hess's law, but also part of the Sean Harbour cycle. And the definitions, have you all got a sheet? Did you not get one? Who else hasn't got one? So, Hess's, so what you've got here are some definitions. You need to learn these, but most of them are fairly straightforward. I'll just read out the first one. Standard lipid change formation is the nth change when one mole of is formed with all species in their standard space. Okay. So, um, I'm afraid you need to be able to quote all of these, every single one, except probably the last two. Okay, The last two are there more for your information rather than you have to know them. I've never seen a question asking you to quote the standard entropy of hydration or the standard entropy of solution. Okay, but I have seen questions asking you to define all of the above. Okay. <coughs> so you need to know those standard entropy changes. Now Hess's law, Hess is a, chem uh, a chemist, well, chemist who, who um, realized that the entropy change was independent of the route taken. Okay. Because if we draw an energy level diagram, here it is, if we go, if we have an exothermic reaction where we go from A to B, okay, it doesn't matter whether we go up to C and then down to D and then down to E. It doesn't matter which route we take. Okay. Overall, this energy change is going to remain constant, of course, because we might put energy in, but then some energy is given out, and then some more energy is given out, and the total of those three changes will be the same as this energy change here, of course. I mean, when you look at it, it's common sense. But that's Hess's law, that the, and you need to know it, Hess's law is that the energy change for a reaction is independent of the route taken or independent of the pathway of the reaction. <clears throat> so what does it mean? Well, basically, it means that if we've got any situation in which we're going from A to B, we can take any route around from A to B. So here is our... Now, this is, this is Hess's law drawn on a, an energy level diagram, E or H up the side here, and this is just Hess's law just drawn as a big cycle. Because we can say, well, if we go from A, let's, we, let's go to C, then we're going to go to D, and then we're going to go to E. But equally, by the way, we could have something completely different. Because those are all arrows going in the same direction. We could have, look, hang on a minute, we could say to ourselves, well, actually, look, it's very easy to convert X to A, and then X also converts to Y, and then Y converts to B. And there we are again. All we have to do is sum the totals of those arrows. Okay. And we end up with the value for A to B. So how do, what sort of questions do you get on Hess's law? Well, most of the time, you get two types of questions that are directly on Hess's law. The first type is when you're asked to find a delta H combustion. So it will say, right, here's your delta H combustion. Carbon dioxide and water, a complete combustion reaction. And it will say, hang on, let me get this right, two lot, one, two, three, four, there. there we go. It'll say, there's your combustion reaction. Find the delta H of reaction there. And usually, you, as I said, there's often two types you get. There's sometimes different types, in which case you're going to have to use your you know, considerable experience of having practiced some of these questions. But sometimes, 